Good evening. This evening, you'll be hearing from candidates for District 7 Board of Supervisors. They will have a chance to present their views on issues affecting the city and to answer your questions about those issues. To submit questions for the candidates, look for a volunteer who will be handing out index cards. We'll be collecting all questions by 7 p.m. The candidates will answer questions you and the audience submit, as well as questions that have been submitted by the League of Women Voters. The timekeepers in the first row will hold up a yellow card to signify candidates that they have 15 seconds remaining and will hold up a red card when it's time to stop. Thank you, timekeepers. All candidates have agreed to ask their supporters to be respectful of other candidates and the audience and to maintain quiet during the forum. I ask you to respect that commitment. You have many important decisions to make on November 8th. Today's forum will give you an opportunity to be heard. Now let's begin. Each candidate is allowed one minute to answer each question. We're gonna start with question one. We'll start with Mr. Engardia. What is your vision of San Francisco in 2020, especially with respect to District 7? What major changes do you see and how will you ensure quality of life? Hi, I'm Joel Engardia. I think it's important in District 7 that we um, really champion the tunneling of the M line, of uh, the Uni line, because it will allow for a true end-to-end -end subway from Embarcadero all the way to Park Merced where there's be a lot of housing built. And that allows for four car trains instead of two, uh, and more capacity, quicker commute time. And I think it's a, it's a common sense solution to uh, a transportation infrastructure problem. Um, we also have, uh, uh, it would alleviate the traffic situation at St. Francis Circle, it would help alleviate traffic problems at 19th Avenue. And um, you know, it's, it's important to invest in transportation infrastructure so we can uh, have a better city. Uh, John Farrell, first off, I want to work with the, the commercial strips, West Portal, Ocean Avenue, make sure we work, work with the merchants in the neighborhoods to make sure we have a very vibrant commercial district. We want to make sure our meeting is reliable and safety, that there's enough vehicles out there. We want to make sure that we take care of high injury corridors, that they're taken care of right away with all the uh, uh, supporting of Vision Zero. We want to make sure we have a city that is uh, balanced. Right now we have a $9.6 billion budget that's not even balanced right now. We need to have an accountable governor. We need to have housing. We might need to stress the fact we need to take care of housing. We have to plan for the future. We must protect our environment. We must take care of our seniors, our children. Uh, we must have safety. We must make sure our streets are clean. Our, our, we stop break-ins. We must have, have everybody taken care of. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ben Matranga. Uh, thank you to the League for, for hosting us all tonight. Thank you all for, for coming out. Um, District 7 represents San Francisco's best. I think it represents um, a quality of life where middle class families uh, can own a home, where you can educate your children. Um, and uh, we need to preserve that. And we need to make sure that the District 7 stays welcoming, stays inviting, uh, and is possible for that next generation of folks uh, that are living, that are raising their families in San Francisco uh, to be able to stay here. Um, I think the number one issue is public safety. Um, as I've mentioned many times, there is as many police officers in San Francisco uh, as when I was growing up in the 1980s. We need more police officers. There is a spike in neighborhood crime, and more police officers will help alleviate that, and that'll be the first thing I champion on the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Hi, I'm Supervisor Norman Yee, and this is a great question to lead off, and thank you for the league for hosting this uh, candidates forum on the good side of uh, the uh, UCSF. Um, it's, all the things that we're talking about is the quality of life and, and how I see 2020, where we will have improved parks, which I'm working on, and which uh, we're already working on the M, M line to make sure that possibly we're gonna increase the percentage of people that can go back and forth from the west side to the east side by double, and that what I'd like to see I'm envisioning is that the percentage of children in, in San Francisco population will increase to the norm of uh, most uh, US, US uh, cities. And to do that, we need to have an infrastructure to support that, including new schools like at Parma said or in the Mission Bay area. 
That's what I'll be fighting for. Hi, Mike Young. Thank you for hosting this event today. Uh, what will District 7 look like in 2020? We need a coordinated consensus built plan that's going to accommodate all the development that's coming online in District 7 to include the additional 5,000 units in Park Merced over the next 30 years, the development of Balboa Reservoir and the renovation at Stonestown, uh, and we're talking about adding more housing there as well. We need to start reaching out to the neighborhoods now and agreeing on how we're gonna accommodate the new hospitals, the new schools, additional police resources, additional fire resources, where the traffic calming uh, measures are gonna be implemented on the streets, as well as an integrated transportation plan that's going to bring us into the next 20, 30 years. That's what 2020 should look like for District 7. Thank you. The next question will start with Mr. Farrell. What would you do to reduce overcrowding on public transit in San Francisco? What would I do to, well basically, uh, public transit has to be reviewed. We have to make sure that we have enough vehicles available. We have to make sure it's more reliable. We have to uh, look at all the uh, streets to make sure they're safe. And uh, basically, we have to really look at Muni. Right now, we have to focus in on all the lines. How, my whole uh, vision for the future is to make a reliable Muni, to make sure it has the funding to get all the vehicles online that is sufficient vehicles, uh, make sure it's safe, reliable, make sure that all the areas are well lit, make sure there's policing, make sure uh, it's available to, for everybody in San Francisco to get around, get around and, and to be able to count on it. Thank you. Um, ben Matranga, um, Muni is incredibly important in a transit first city. Um, and I uh, firmly believe we need a transit system that is clean, safe, and reliable as much as that. And I think in terms of overcrowding specifically, it's about increasing the quality of, of rolling stock that we have here in San Francisco. Uh, our rolling stock is in, in uh, the best state of good repair. Uh, there's capital plans to improve it. We need to make sure those get rolled out. Uh, and then secondarily, make sure uh, that we have drivers that are meeting their routes so we're not canceling routes uh, mid, uh, mid route. So folks are, you know, it says there's gonna be something there in 10 minutes and it doesn't show up for another 20 minutes. Norman Yee, um, we've, I've already mentioned the, about the M line, in which I'm already starting the process of looking at uh, creating um, basically a tunnel or underground passage on 19th Avenue. And I, I'm also trying to explore other possibilities of a east-west um, uh, line that would go underneath also, because we, that, that line right now is pretty limited. And so we need to increase the capacity. We need to buy newer buses to update the buses so it doesn't break down every day. And that's what's going to uh, relieve the overcrowding. Right now what happens when, when the bus breaks down, they take it offline. So that's one fewer bus that on a particular line. A lot of times we actually lose a few buses on the line on, on a daily basis. That's what's causing some of the overcrowding. You know, if, if problems were easy to fix, it would have been done already. Uh, overcrowding on Muni is not, an easy, is not an easy fix. It takes planning, it takes deliberate planning and, and foresight. Um, I'm a big fan of undergrounding the metro wherever we can so that we can have, we can extend the cars to four cars rather than the two that we currently have now because the streets can't bear uh, four cars. That would be one solution to alleviating the overcrowding. Uh, the development along Brotherhood Way in Park Merced in part was predicated on federal funds being promised for transportation product, uh, projects. We need to be looking at those funds right now and how we're going to use those funds to alleviate the overcrowding that we have now, we need, to, we need to play catch up as well as the additional density that's coming online today. So I would, I would be planning to look at those federal funds uh, and how we're gonna use those to lessen the crowding. There's a lot of things we regret not doing when we had the chance, like building lots of BART tunnels or even tunneling that M line 40 years ago when it was first proposed. So we need to think big and when, um, I was talking with the person who's planning this M-Line uh, tunnel project. You know, originally it was gonna be a bridge or maybe not a tunnel the whole way, and, and she said, you know, I just, I just wanna shoot for the moon and, and tunnel it all the way to Park Merced. And I said, well, why don't we shoot for Mars and take it to Daly City, BART? Because ultimately we need to look at things holistically. 
because all these things work together and we need to talk about a tunnel along Geary and we need to definitely get the uh, central subway all the way to Fisherman's Wharf so it makes sense to connect our number one tourist attraction with Moscone Center for all the convention uh, goers. So it's important to look at things uh, holistically and, and think big. Start with Mr. Matranga, and it is a multi part question. How many new housing units does District 7 need? Where should they be? How will you help get them built? Yeah, it's, you know, let's, let's start with where we're at right now in, in District 7. Um, of all of the supervisorial districts, District 7 has the, the, is number three in terms of housing units that are in the pipeline. Um, so there is already a significant amount of housing coming online in District 7, um, which is a great thing. I think if you, you know, it, it's typically talked about uh, that, you know, District 7 is the area of the city that has a lot of single family homes, uh, but there's an incredibly large percentage of renters, whether you live in Park Merced, whether you're in the inner sunset uh, around here. Um, and, you know, the conversation in those places, if you look at Park Merced, has shifted to how do we protect the most vulnerable? How do we make sure that seniors that are out at Park Merced have uh, uh, proper rent control and can stay in the units that they need? I think the biggest challenge that we have um, with housing, specifically in the district, is too often we're promised the housing, but the requisite infrastructure doesn't come along with it. That has been promised. Those promises have not always been kept. As supervisor, I'll make sure that infrastructure gets built. Um, as um, already mentioned, District 7 actually has quite a few housing projects that's been built recently along Ocean Avenue. Uh, and then, of course, Partners said area has been uh, a deal that's been uh, on the plans for a little while, and they're actually beginning to, to move on the plans. And we're, now we're talking about other uh, spaces like Balboa Reservoir and Kirkham Heights, in which I'm working with, with the community. I want to make sure whatever we do in the district, and we are uh, having our fair share of housing, that the neighbors really work with the developers to make sure that there's some satisfaction about keeping uh, our neighborhood character characteristics uh, intact while we're actually trying to balance it with some growth. Uh, that's, where, that's where we're at at this point. I think we're doing a really good job in the district. People are open to it. Sometimes not, not everybody is open to it, but many people are actually open to some development in District 7. I'm sorry, I want to respond directly to the questions that you asked. The only one that I caught was how many, how many, how many housing units does District 7 need? And the other ones were? Where should they be? And how will you help get them built? Okay. Um, it's clear that there is a great demand for housing citywide. Uh, the exact numbers, I'm not sure anyone really knows ex what that exact number is. District 7 has stepped up to the plate. We're taking on all the housing at Park Merced. We're going forward with the plans of re uh, renovation at Stonestown, and we're in the talks right now for Balboa Reservoir. Uh, where should they be? Those three locations. Uh, how do we get them built? You have to ride the project. Um, they require leadership. They require communication, consensus building between the neighborhoods, <clears throat> the stakeholders in other regions around uh, San Francisco, including uh, the, the adjoining districts, and also representation at City Hall. Um, and that's what a leader should be doing, is being in the middle of that process, engaging in that process, and leading that process. Hi, I'm Joel Lingardio. So there are three problems facing District 7 residents that some reasonable housing can solve. Problem one, people are saying, I want a more vibrant commercial district. I'm tired of all the empty storefronts. Problem two, senior citizens are saying, what am I going to do when my house is too big to take care of? I can't navigate the stairs. Where am I going to go? Where am I going to downsize to? Problem three, the baby boomers who say, where are my adult children going to live and my grandkids? I'd like them to stay in San Francisco so they can be close to me. A reasonable amount of housing along the transit corridors, which I define as the street upon which Muni train is, a few stories of housing above retail creates the demand for the vibrant retail that the single family homeowners will enjoy. It allows for elevator buildings that senior citizens can downsize to and they can rent out their home to a new young family. And it creates housing for our kids and grandkids. This makes absolute sense and it needs to be done. And how do we do it? Build a coalition. Lots of senior citizens now see it's in their vested interest that we built this housing. That's how you get it done. Thank you. You know, I've uh, 
looked at uh, Balboa Reservoir. I've gone to meetings on that. I've gone to meetings on Park Merced. And you know, every time I go to those meetings, I just shake my head because everybody, you're looking at, you're looking at Park Merced, you're looking at uh, San Francisco State that wants to build student housing. Getting around there is a nightmare and they want to cut back on parking. They want to build projects now that don't have one unit of parking for, a, you know, a one space for one unit. It's ridiculous. There's going to be so much congestion. I want to get in there and make sure developers are meeting their goals. I see how they're treating tenants at Park Merced. I don't like what I see. I see Balboa Reservoir with uh, parking issues there. Uh, you you want to get in the process. There's 150 units senior housing that they want to put on Laguna Honda. They never talk to the neighbors about it. 30% are for homeless. And they're pushing it through without the neighborhood uh, involved. The neighborhood has to be involved. Everybody has to come to the table. I will make sure that people are accountable, the developers. I'll make sure that the tenants are being respected the way they deserve. I'll make sure that I will be there for, for the uh, residents and, and make sure things go. Thank you. The next question, we're going to start with Mr. Yee. Um, regarding early education, how do you plan to provide more access to early education programs in San Francisco, and how do you plan to fund this? Good, good question. This is um, my field that I came from, early education. Um, we, I started the preschool for uh, all program in, in San Francisco, and in fact, um, uh, I've done a couple of things since I've uh, been a supervisor. One. I've uh, worked with the developers to increase the development fee for child care, and all of them agree that it, it would be okay to add the residential development, so that's going to give us uh, additional funding. The, um, um, I, I'm having some proposition uh, legislation right now that's going through the process of uh, creating the a counterpart or a companion piece for the preschool for all, which is going to be the the Infant and Toddler Early Learning uh, Scholarship Fund, which will create a program to increase the number of, of babies that can be taken care of in, in San Francisco. Plus, I work with the San Francisco Giants and the Mission, Bay, Mission Rock, um, Mission Rock uh, Development and also the 5M, in which they both agreed to put uh, additional childcare space for, uh, for people to use. Was working when I was going to public school at Roosevelt and Lowell on the days that I was playing hooky. Sorry, mom. Uh, I would get a call from school asking why isn't Michael here. Uh, schools get paid per student that shows up. So when I hear, um, you know, San Francisco schools aren't good because there aren't any families here, because there aren't any children. Well, the children don't come, and the families don't stay because the schools aren't good. So it's a vicious cycle. Um, for me, it comes down to middle income family, uh, middle income housing. We need to do everything we can to keep families in San Francisco so that there is demand for these types of services. Uh, and we should do that by adjusting the AMI uh, and with, with coordination with City Hall to build that housing. Uh, Joel and Gardio, you know, a lot of families leave San Francisco when their kids turn uh, age four or five, and, um, you know, we can do all we want for early education, early care, but if we can't keep the families here once the kid turns four or five, that, that's defeating the purpose. We need to look at the big picture, and it's important that um, we treat parents in San Francisco like customers uh, when it comes to the, the public school system. And, and oftentimes, uh, the parents um, might get their kid into an elementary school and be happy with it, and then they leave when it comes to middle school time because the middle schools are getting rid of algebra and honors programs and, and not catering to what the customers want. So th this is an issue that we need to look at uh, in, in the long term as far as how do we keep the family in San Francisco from birth through graduation of high school and then have a place for them when the kid comes back from college to build a life here? Well, I'm going to uh, focus in on uh, money first. Basically, the city has enough money right now that it's not even bringing in to take care of all these programs. And that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm against most of the propositions to increase taxes. If City Hall was doing its job, it wouldn't have to do that. Now, what I would do is first, I would bring in revenue to the city. I would identify it. I have a track record of bringing millions, hundreds of millions into the city. I have a track record of doing that and streamlining. 
What I do is I'd ask the experts what the, I, first off, I was embarrassed when I was reading the paper that there weren't no, that the school year was starting out without enough teachers. To me, that's an emergency. These things are unacceptable. What I would do is basically talk to the experts who know what, what needs to be done. I would find the funding. I would work with the schools. I'd, I'd keep people, I mean, I would try to do what I could to, to make sure we have teachers here. Affordable housing, we would get the money for the housing. I have no problem for that. Thank you. So the question was specifically about uh, early education. And you know, several years ago, we passed a point in the state of California where the cost of early childhood education is now more expensive than in-state four-year tuition uh, at a university. And a lot of the savings mechanisms we have and a lot of the, you know, the anxiety that uh, uh, folks of my parents' generation felt was on one end of their child's life. But they had an 18-year lead up to be able to save for that event when it happened. Now what we do is we have a problem where younger parents are feeling that anxiety both on the front end of their child's life than on the back end. Then you lay on top of that an, a school system in San Francisco where you know, there is no uh, you know, neighborhood preference is you know, a lower priority, so kids are taking one or two buses to get to school. So it's, it's, you know, it, it's about funding that early childhood education and making sure kids can stay in their communities and be able to access it there. The next question, we're going to start with Mr. Young, and we are back to transportation. How will you increase access to public transportation and support cyclists and pedestrians. You know, the west side is facing a lot of growth pressure. Um, and a lot of older retired residents live on the west side. They're the ones who have built San Francisco that made it the place that I grew up and that I appreciate. We have a lot of new interests coming in, newcomers with new ideas and new ambitions, and I think we need to manage that transition. I don't think we should take away cars right away. I don't think we should take away parking right away. There are a lot of people who can't walk. There are a lot of people who have trouble taking public transportation, having to get on and get off. Should we make accommodations for it going forward? Absolutely, we should. But it should be a managed conversation between what the residents of District 7 want on the west side as well as the newcomers. So. That would be my solution, is to have a managed conversation, incremental accommodations for biking and additional public, public transportation. Hi, Joel and Gardio. So <clears throat> San Francisco bike share is going to expand immensely in 2017 and 2018, thanks to tens of millions of dollars from the Ford Motor Company of all companies. They're, they want to become a mobility company. Um, but what's going to happen is you're going to have a lot more kiosks and bikes, like the bike share program. District 7 won't take effect to probably phase 5 or 6. So here's the opportunity. Yes, there's tension between drivers and bicyclists. And yes, we need to accommodate the baby boomers and senior citizens who rely on their cars. But here's the opportunity. With, with the families who live in 7, they would like to safely bike from their home to the park or to Lake Merced or safely bike or if you're commuting to work, to that ex that I walk a 10 minute walk to my muni station. If there's a kiosk near me, I'd maybe bike to that, that uh, station. So I think there's a way to smartly put these kiosks in seven so it actually benefits families and we plan the routes so it doesn't um, disturb motorists and it gets everyone acclimated to how a bike can uh, improve uh, your life. Well, I think the main thing here is to, to design our streets to support traffic, to make sure they're safe for pedestrians and for uh, a bicyclist. Uh, it has to be a co coordinated effort between the neighbors with the city. Everybody has to be involved to see what, you know, meet everybody's needs, get everybody's input. Uh, Muni has to be much safer. We have to be more reliable. Uh, like I said, there has to be enough uh, Muni uh, buses for the system in order to, to make people, to have enough for, uh, for people to use. Uh, but in order to make this a whole safe, we have to just make a safe, we have to design it very safely. Thank you. Um, ben Matranga, um, you know, this is right in my wheelhouse. Um, San Francisco has always been a multimodal city, um, and it will remain that way. Um, and I think the key on top of all of that is to make sure that safety is the most important thing. 
Uh, now, most recently, I served as San Francisco's first street safety director, um, where we launched a very ambitious plan um, to put in safety infrastructure all over the city. Um, we exceeded our goal by about 30%. We did it on time and under budget. Uh, these are not words you typically hear coming from City Hall, uh, but we were able to do that because we had a coordinated approach, worked with departments, um, we had a, a very thoughtful multimodal system that was based on data that, at, at the end of the day, prioritized safety more than anything else. Um, Norman Yee again, and uh, the, so what I've been able to champion is what we call the vi Vision Zero policy for San Francisco, whose goal is uh, to have no fat fatalities of pedestrians and bicyclists by 2024. And there's basically three strategies, enforcement, uh, engineering of streets to make it safer, and also education. So that's what we're pursuing. We've been doing that for the last year, two years. And for me, as I go further, I, I'm using my partic uh, participatory budgeting uh, program to fund pedestrian safety measures in which residents that, uh, get to pick and choose which ones they believe are the best suited for their neighborhoods. I funded 19 of them uh, in the last three years, and I'm hoping to do a lot more in the next four years. Thank you. So we have a very quick five-second follow-up question. We're going to start with Mr. Young and go in the same order. How did you get to tonight's forum? I drove. Mr. Ingardia? Oh. Uber. I drove, yeah. I parked about six blocks away, then I walked. <laughs> 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 I, I, I shared a ride uh, with my wife and got dropped off in front because there was no parking. I, I, I drove, but you know, I was smarter, smarter and parked two blocks away. <laughs> Thank you. Our next question, and we'll start with Mr. Engardio. Um, regarding the Sunshine Ordinance, do you support the Sunshine ordin Ordinance? And regarding open and transparent governance, is it a burden or a benefit? I definitely support it. I, I worked as a journalist, so I had to do a lot of uh, requests you know, for records. So I think it's important. It's uh, in a democracy, in an open society, in a place where we value the First Amendment. It's very important to uh, have open government. It should not be a burden. And for the sunshine, everything should be transparent. Thank you. Absolutely. I think San Francisco, one of the most unique features of our government is its openness, uh, is, is its transparency. Um, my first ever internship in 1996 when I was in high school was with the San Francisco Ethics Commission. Uh, on this campaign, I have been championing reform uh, around campaign contributions. I think it's incredibly important. Uh, our campaign made a commitment from the first day. We won't take a dime from registered lobbyists. I think it's incredibly important that voters understand who's financing their candidates and what does that mean and how does that influence their decisions, especially on land use. Definitely support the Sunshine Ordinance, and uh, in fact, I'm, I'm one of the few supervisors when people ask for um, information, communication, emails, and so forth, um, that they you don't see my name in a newspaper where they would say, oh, uh, so-and-so didn't give the information. And in fact, uh, I, I believe in transparency. That's why I'm so, uh, I've been doing this participatory budgeting program in which the residents actually know what they're spending their money on, or, or not their money, where is their money? It's the city's money. Um, and uh, so I would further, in fact, in the DCCC, we're supporting um, uh, limiting how much people can give to that particular, particular um, uh, um, uh, campaign. I do support the Sunshine Ordinance and I support open government so that the people can understand what's going on uh, in, in, during the policy making process. That does need to be transparent. However, I will say that there is something to be said for open, honest communication between individuals. That's the only way that you can begin to build consensus and to be able to understand really what the other side is saying in a genuine way so that you can come to decisions that are meaningful rather than saying things you think you need to say because you, you know other people are listening. That's something, freedom is predicated on privacy. 
we have that we have that ability to be private to have these conversations so that we can we can turn over our ideas and and bounce ideas off of each other so we can come to the best decisions that's that's a basic element of, of American society and of the freedoms that we have. I would like to see some sort of accommodation within the government as well uh, between politicians. Our next question will start with Mr. Farrell. What do you see as the biggest challenge facing District 7? Oh, the biggest problem is right now is safety. You want to make sure that uh, you know stopping the break-ins, you want to you want to make sure that our streets are safe, they're, uh, you want to get rid of the higher injury corridors. You want to make sure the homeless are taken care of before it gets out of hand. There's several in the district. You want to make sure they're, they're taken care of and get the, get the services they need, whether they're mentally ill or whether they're uh, uh, drug addicted. Uh, you want to make sure our streets are clean. You want to make sure our, our police are accountable. You want to make sure they're, they're patrolling. You want to make sure that uh, uh, just basically, you want to work with the merchants. You want to have a coordinated effort with the with the neighborhood, with the schools, to make sure we have a, a safe neighborhood. Thank you, uh, Ben Matranga. The single biggest issue, far and away, is public safety, and you know it, it, it's it, District Seven has always been a place where you know you should be able to walk on the street at night you should be able to go to the, go down to the neighborhood commercial corridor and buy what you need you should be have confidence that your kid could go and walk to the playground um, and you know this spike in neighborhood crime has come from a lack of police officers and a lack of attentiveness from the board of supervisors um, i am extraordinarily proud to be the only candidate in this race endorsed by all four of our major public safety organizations. Uh, this is the police officers, the firefighters, the deputy sheriffs, and the district attorney investigators. Um, and the reason is because we have a plan. I think it's incredibly important when you talk about public safety, you work with the folks that are gonna implement it, and you already, during the campaign, get things in motion to make sure that when you're elected, from day one, we make, we make District 7 safer for everyone. Most likely all five of us are going to have the same answer in terms of what's the most important, which is really probably crime that's heading the district. Even though it's not the highest in, in, in San Francisco in terms of a district, it's spiked quite a bit in the district. I've been working with the police department for over a year to increase the number of police officers assigned to our, our stations that uh, actually uh, cover District 7. We have an additional 12 officers now. Um, I've brought back the B cops um, that was lost for a little while there, so that we there's some presence in the street. Um, I've also increased the budget, uh, help increase the budget for the uh, SF Safe, so that they can continue working with neighborhood groups for the crime watch. And more and more recently, I'm working with the police uh, um, rank and file commissioners and so forth to come up with a, a plan for neighborhood crime unit that I will be, uh, actually we're gonna be voting on it on Tuesday. And for, uh, beyond that, I'm actually creating a, a task force that's gonna look at staffing, police staffing. Once we reach the number of 1971, which is uh, a, a minimum right now, in, at the end of next year. The most important issue in District 7, absolutely public safety. We need more police on the streets. Uh, the minimum staffing for police right now is 1,971. That was set in 1994. That number has not been updated, nor have we ever been able to meet that minimum level of uh, police staffing. Uh, we need to look at uh, what we think minimum staffing should be, as well as workload counts. Uh, being in national security for 10 years, we often said security is like air. You don't know you need it until it's gone. Uh, burglary, burglary theft from vehicles is down over the past couple months, but I think we shouldn't let that lull us into being lax. We still need to make public safety and police on the streets our number one priority. Joel and Guardio, crime is definitely top of mind. When we had this huge spike that um, back in January, February, it just it felt like a tidal wave of sorts. Um, a lot of neighborhood groups on their own had to get together and ask what is happening, figure out what can we do. Um, and they were looking for leadership. And I think it's important that we have a supervisor who uh, follows the data, looks at the trends, and is in communication with the neighborhoods. So when 
uh, something like this happens that people aren't, uh, people are prepared for it and people, you can build a coalition and work together and marshal the resources you need to tackle the issue. Um, so that's why crime is top of mind right now. But I think it's also uh, part of a larger uh, um, issue of quality of life. People, the crime is very visceral, but they're feeling squeezed in many ways with their kids going to school and with transportation and housing. And so uh, people are just feeling generally stressed and they're looking for leadership. Our next question. Mr. Matranga, um, this is a multi-part question I'm going to try and break down. This is regarding Proposition H. Um, the first question will make yes or no. Do you support Proposition H creating a public advocate? If your answer is yes, tell us why you think it's appropriate to spend $4.3 million on this measure when supervisors should also be advocates for their district. Absolutely no. No question. This is a horrible idea. Um, I, I'm against Proposition H. I'm against the creation of public advocate. Um, I think it was created, uh, you know, it, we have district supervisors. Many folks in District 7 remember when we used to have citywide elections uh, and we elected supervisors citywide. And part of the transition to district elections where you wanted a supervisor who can focus on district issues, hold government accountable and work to, you know, uh, work with the departments to make sure things were getting done. If they weren't, the Board of Supervisors right now, every single supervisor, has the ability of inquiry. They can call a hearing at any point. So those tools already exist within the current system. There's absolutely no reason we need an additional wasteful layer of city government. Now some folks will, will talk about they back it, they want a little bit more transparency, but it is a naked political move, and I think we should question the motives of folks that are supporting it and introducing it. I support uh, Prop H. Um, the reason why I'm supporting it is when it was introduced, or uh, I, as somebody asked me to look at this uh, as an issue, I actually read up on it on uh, what happened in New York, and it was very positive in terms of the outcomes, things that a city councilman may not be able to, to be dealing with. And as a supervisor, a district supervisor, of course I'm gonna advocate for my own district. Uh, but there's a lot of other over, overarching issues that a public advocate can take on a lot better than uh, a supervisor uh, at the district level. No, I do not support Prop H. Um, we, we already have supervisors, we have elected officials already, they have staff. Um, as for the comparison to New York, we're not New York. New York's a very different city, it's much, much bigger. Um, in fact, I think Prop H is expensive, I think it's redundant, it, and it would be cheaper, actually, just to hire an additional staff in your supervisor's office, which would come out to be about under 1.5 million. So no on Prop H. Joel Engardio, absolutely no on Prop H. Now let's play this out. So we have a public advocate. What are, what are they gonna be doing from day one? Running for mayor. They're just going to be uh, politicking and blocking the mayor and making him ineffectual every step of the way that they can until they become mayor. And then the next public advocate will just do the same thing. And, and we're gonna spend millions of dollars doing it. And it, it, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, and then the New York example doesn't it just, it's, it's not apples and apples. It's, uh, I mean, New York has eight million people. It's got five borough presidents. It's got something like 140 city council members. You know, we just have 11 supervisors and a mayor. So, you know, so maybe New York needs a public advocate. We, we don't need it here. We have plenty of advocates. We're, and you can elect one up here today to, to represent you in District 7 and be your advocate. I'm against the public advocate. Now, the public advocate, what it's supposed to do is take care of public concerns. I mean, I thought that was part of the job of the supervisor. <clears throat> you don't need to spend the money there. As I've said in a lot of other uh, forums, I will be uh, District 7's public advocate. Thank you. Great, so our last question for this evening, um, we'll start with Mr. Yee. If elected, what commitment would you make to work with neighbors to get their input on new development in District 7? I actually have a track a record of uh, including neighbors in getting their inputs into, into projects. Uh, when the Balboa Reservoir uh, project was brought up, uh, the city went in there and had community meetings uh, and basically in three months we are going to get it done and, and move on and have a, a proposal be, uh, be sent to them. 
And I said, no time out. Uh, I don't believe that our neighbors are getting their, their voices uh, heard. So I, I, I formed a, a community advisory committee made up of mostly people from the area. And uh, during this more than one year of process, we've had 16 meetings with community input. And things have changed from, from one uh, extreme to other. We're not building 5,000 units. We're building, uh, if anything, if it's going to be done, it's going to be uh, about 500 units. So uh, every, every word that I, I can get a chance, I try to get community input, including my participatory budgeting uh, program. I lived in countries where civil society doesn't exist, where we couldn't have forums like this, we couldn't be running for office, and you wouldn't have the right to say what you thought about your government in an honest way. What we have with the neighborhood associations is it's something very, very precious that I take very seriously. We need aggressive interaction with the neighborhood associations. They're the representatives of what's going on in the city. I'd like to commend, actually, Supervisor Yi for the participatory budgeting process because it gives people a real way of engaging with our government. Um, one, one example is, for instance, I understand there's a 150, 150 unit building coming up on Laguna Honda that took neighbors by surprise. That should have never happened. It should have been, we should have looped in the community from the very beginning, uh, and no one should be surprised. So I, my commitment would be to engage aggressively and often with neighborhood associations. Joel Lingardio, I am excited to work with people in the community to help them get what they want. You hear all the time, I want a bakery, I want this, I want, I want buy right, why isn't buy right on West Portal Avenue? Why not, why won't they come? I think what we need to do, the supervisor should work with people and create a marketing plan and show the demographics and, and, and sell District 7. And, and when someone says, I want X, Y, or Z, then we'll put together that marketing plan and we'll go out there and we'll sell it and we'll do the best PR and we'll demonstrate that there is a demand for that service and that District 7 is a great place to do business and to revitalize our commercial districts. So I'm excited about working with people on that. Well, in regard to the neighbors and commercial, basically I'm accountable to you. I work for you. I want to make sure that any time any development is even, even considered by the city and county of San Francisco, that the neighbors are involved right up front. Uh, Mike brought up the fact there's a 150 unit development that is on uh, Laguna Honda by the city lodge that's going to be 30% homeless, that are 30% to be determined by the developer on who stays there. The, the, the neighbors only found out because of a newspaper in the Chronicle two weeks earlier. This is wrong. I look at uh, Park Merced, I look there, I see what's going on there. There has to be a coordinated effort. I don't like what I see with how the tenants are being treated at Park Merced. I, parking is a terrible issue. I will, be, uh, I will not be a complacent supervisor. I'll be involved in every aspect to make sure developers are meeting their, their uh, what they, what they promise, and I'll, I'll, my concern, like I said, I work for you. I think it's incredibly important that a supervisor on land use issues is proactive and not reactive. Um, I, I think you know, too often the planning department uh, doesn't serve neighborhoods, it just serves the interests of developers. Um, and I think what we have is, you know, it, it, these processes become reactive Everyone puts in these hours, you go to the 16 meetings, you hope that it's gonna be an open forum, but the outcome's already determined. So it, it, it actually, for a, I think for a lot of neighbors, they feel like there isn't actual genuine input on it. You get up there, you, you know, after a hard day's worth of work, um, you, know, you show up to the meeting, you get your two minutes of public comment, but nothing ever happens about it. I think it's more than just having forums where people can say their piece. I think it's actually actively listening, being proactive, listening to what neighbors want, and actually acting on it and implementing it. Now we come to the candidates' closing statements. But let me first remind you that if you aren't registered to vote, please do so right away and urge others you know to register. The actual deadline is October 24th, and if you've moved, you do need to register again at your new address. 
We will do the closing statements in reverse alphabetical order, and remember that you have two minutes. We'll start with Mr. Young. You know, being overseas for 10 years as a diplomat with the State Department, I would pine to come back to San Francisco nearly every day. I thank San Francisco for making me who I am today. I thank the hills, I thank the air, the water, the people who built this city. I wanna come back and offer to the voters of San Francisco myself to carry your voice to City Hall to help us plan together the future of San Francisco, a viable city that we can all be proud of. That's why I'm running. Furthermore, this again is a precious opportunity. Not everyone in the world gets to vote. There are a lot of oppressive regimes around the world. They have no say in their futures. In this election, this one in particular, not only do you get to vote, you get to vote three times. It's kind of special, I like that. Um, so please, uh, I hope you vote for me number one, and I hope you avail yourself of all three votes. Thank you very much. Thank you once, once again to the league, and uh, I'm Norman Yee, I'm uh, running for re-election, and um, probably more than ever, it's important for me to want to be in this position uh, I became a, a, a granddad for the first time six weeks ago uh, to my granddaughter, Nyla, and um, I'm looking at my phone constantly because my daughter was, my other daughter was due yesterday. So I'm waiting for my grandson to be born, and uh, she's gonna, he's gonna be living in the city. So these, whatever we do in the city is gonna be impacting my grandkids. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in continuing my work around uh, family housing is something that nobody ever talks about. They talk about affordable and uh, and market rate housing, and that's important to do that. But we need to push for family housing. What's appropriate for families? Um, I want to continue um, building the infrastructure that's going to support these families. Uh, additional schools, additional uh, early education programs. Uh, I want to create. Uh, uh, I mentioned earlier, create a blue ribbon task force to look at best practices to increase the number of police officers in San Francisco once we reach this uh, minimum of two, uh, 1971. And the other thing that I wanna do, continue doing, is to make sure that people in District 7 get their fair share. It's something that we, we've been very critical of in, in past years, that it seems like we never get any attention out on the west side. Well, I brought the attention back to us. I've been able to fight for resources, uh, probably more resources in the last three years, four years, than my predecessors have done in the last 20. And I'm really proud that uh, people are really grabbing onto this program called participatory budgeting. Uh, this, this year's vote came to, in terms of how many projects they voted for, 11, 000, over 11,000 people vote, uh, were voted on. So it's a growing, it's a growing, um, uh, thing that people really want to participate in, and, and hopefully we can keep on doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you, and then let me uh, start by thanking the League of Women Voters for uh, putting this together. Um, you know, it's, throughout this campaign, we've had the incredible joy of walking all over uh, District 7. Uh, our campaign has knocked on over 9,000 doors. Uh, and the more we talk to folks, the more we realize there's an overwhelming sense uh, that the city is going in the wrong direction, that people want a supervisor who's responsive, who's honest, who's hardworking, um, who can you know, come to the neighborhood meetings, and who can reach out to them and understand where they're coming from. Um, you know, I, I've been endorsed by leaders like Fiona Ma, uh, two former Board of Supervisor Presidents, Angela Aliotto and Barbara Kaufman, uh, by a former supervisor on the West Side, Anne Marie Conroy, um, by the Building and Construction Trades Council, uh, the RFK Democratic Club, and I'm also the only candidate endorsed by uh, the four major public safety organizations, the police officers, firefighters, the deputy sheriffs, and uh, the district attorney investigators. Uh, and I think they all realize that that lack of attendedness has led to all of the issues that we're talking about here today. Whether that's the increase in crime, whether that's the need for more infrastructure. You know, in this electoral process, you, know, you have 
an opportunity once elected to implement an agenda. And when that doesn't happen and you don't perform on that, voters have a choice to reelect you or not. Um, so we are incredibly excited about it. Thank you very much for coming out. I respectfully ask for your vote this November. Uh, John Farrell. Now, City Hall has a $9.6 billion budget, which is $1 billion more than it was two years ago. But we still fall short with affordability, safety, homelessness. Our once quiet streets are now suffering from break-ins, from traffic congestion, from lack of parking. I have the qualifications, the experience, and dedication to make a difference. For the city, I was an assistant assessor. I was finance director at Treasure Island. I was a, a management assistant, I mean a, a senior budget analyst for uh, Harvey Rose, the budget analyst. I was a mayor's budget analyst under Frank Jordan. I was a senior management assistant to the port and I was a recreation uh, director at Midtown Terrace for three years. I had a track record of bringing uh, millions to the city and streamlining. I will bring in, I will say, I will identify over $100 million my first year in office. I will cut costs and I will streamline. Uh, I would appreciate your vote on, for John Farrell as your first choice in, in, on November 8th. And if not, like Mike stated, make sure you fill in all. Uh, make sure if I'm not your first choice, your second choice. Uh, I am, I am uh, endorsed by Tony Hall, supervisor. I'm also uh, endorsed by U.S. attorneys Joe Rusinello and Kevin Ryan. It would be an honor and a privilege to serve the citizens of San Francisco and represent uh, District 7, I work for you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joel Engardio. I'm the only candidate endorsed by the San Francisco Chronicle. I'm also endorsed by supervisors Katie Tang and Scott Weiner. People ask me, why do I want to be a supervisor? And my joke answer is because I have 28 years left on my mortgage. But it's not really a joke. When I look at 28 years of payments, I have to wonder, where is San Francisco going? What's it gonna become? I've lived in San Francisco 18 years of my adult life. I fell in love with this city and I wanna stay in love. I'm running for supervisor because San Francisco is changing and I wanna help manage that change so we can all continue to enjoy what makes our city, the West Side, and especially District 7, so special. I worked many years as a journalist, being a watchdog, asking tough questions, holding government accountable. I want to do that from inside City Hall. Homeowners are tired of being City, Hall, being City Hall's ATM. Our budget's doubled in 10 years, nothing's twice as good. People don't feel as safe in their neighborhoods anymore. People feel unheard at City Hall. They're frustrated by the complacency. I want to advocate for the neighborhoods I want to use my journalism skills to investigate how City Hall spends our money. We need to look at every program, measure for results, and only pay for what works. And I'll be responsive to your needs. City Hall likes to think too highly of itself. It forgets that its primary function is basic city services like filling potholes and making the buses run on time. As supervisor, I want to get back to basics. And in 28 years, when my mortgage is paid off, I'll be 71. And I will look back on my time as supervisor and call it a success if our kids and grandkids are enjoying a future in San Francisco. I'm Joel Engardio, and I'm asking for your vote so we can have a voice at City Hall. Thank you. On behalf of myself, the League of Women Voters, and our partner organizations, SFGovTV and the University of California, San Francisco, our thanks to the candidates for participating this evening. Thank you to each of you for taking time to inform yourselves about your choices on November 8th. Good evening. <laughs>